Hi folks, welcome back. So after taking a break from uh, my pneumonia, which I'm still not all the way over, it's been like two months, but hopefully I'll get through this one without coughing as well. And then after doing the last video on Christmas, I'm gonna get back to, in this one, I'm gonna get back to continuing our discussion about polymorphisms. And in the um, last video I did on polymorphisms, I ended by explaining how the evolutionist will dress up polymorphisms to make them look like mutations, to deceive people into believing that they're a genetic force acting in an evolutionary manner. And they do this all the time. So let me continue our discussion here because I have a lot more that I need to explain uh, on in relation to this topic. And I, as I expressed in that previous video, polymorphisms are different from mutations. Polymorphisms are so different from mutations that their genetic consequences within a species are expected and they can be calculated. Therefore, there's nothing mystical, magical, or theoretical about them. Actual polymorphism rates vary depending on the gene and the population that you're examining. And as I told you previously, polymorphisms are the source of genetic variation that causes phenotypic variation. This means that all the characteristics that can be observed, like color, texture, height, etc., all of these are related to polymorphisms. So they very commonly do have genetic consequences. In fact, that's their job. That's their whole purpose, to create phenotypic variation. The genetic differences they cause create different alleles or versions of the same gene, which is called the genotype, that we can observe in a given population, which is called the phenotype. For example, different genotypes or different alleles of the genes for hair color and eye color will result in different phenotypes, brown hair versus blonde hair, brown eyes versus blue eyes, etc. Since polymorphisms occur within our germline DNA, they are passed on to our offspring, which is an example of heritability. During fertilization, our mother provides half of our copies of our chromosomes and one complete set of alleles of all our genes via her egg and our father provides the other half of our chromosomes through his sperm, the other complete set of alleles of all our genes. We get two complete yet different sets of alleles or versions of our genes at fertilization. Only one of the two potential alleles of each gene that our parents have is given to us and a new mixture of polymorphisms, or alleles, is then manifested in our genotype and phenotype. Therefore, alleles are constantly being mixed and matched in a given population via the process of fertilization. Now, in a population that's more open genetically, where the people in that population are from a wider uh, variation of backgrounds, you'll have a lot more alleles present. This allows for more alleles to be mixed in the offspring. Therefore, in a population like this, you'll see a wide variety of phenotypes that arise from the greater number of mixing events of genotypes that are possible. You'll see a wide variety of skin color, hair color, hair texture, eye color, height, facial features, etc. This is the reason 
you see a wider variety of phenotypes in a place like America, where we come from a wide variety of countries and have been intermingling our gene alleles for quite some time now. The more alleles or genotypes in a population, the more those alleles can be mixed and matched, and the more variety of phenotypes you'll see. A population like this makes it harder for any one allele to dominate, and you'll see more variety and less dominance. However, in a population that's been segregated, the number of genotypes that are present is limited. Without new gene alleles coming into a population, that population will be genetically separated from other populations. During fertilization, the same alleles just keep getting mixed, since there are fewer options to offer the offspring. There's just not as many choices. In a population like this, you'll see less variety and more dominance of alleles. This is the reason you can go to other parts of the world where those people groups have been living together for a long period of time and see certain phenotypic traits dominate there. For example, if you go to Scandinavia, you'll see a lot of white skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. You'll see all of that dominate. If you go to Africa, you'll see a lot of dark skin, brown eyes, and dark hair. You'll see those dominate. If you go to the Middle East, you'll see what you might call an intermediate skin color dominate. If you go to the Far East, you'll see dark, a lot of dark straight hair and what a lot of people refer to as a yellowish skin tone you'll see all of that dominate. And here's the thing, this not only holds true for humans, it holds true for every species on the planet. What's important to know here is that the alleles that are passed on to our offspring are the only the ones that are found in our germline DNA. You can only pass on to your offspring one of the two options that you got from your parents. The environment has nothing to do with it. People often think that if they go to live in a different climate, for example, their future families will eventually take on the phenotypes of those native to that area. Uh, for example, a lot of people, if they think, so if you're white like me, and they move to some place, let's say along the equator, where you get a lot of the intense sunshine all year round, like South America or Africa or someplace like that, that their future, and then if their future generations continue to live there, that the skin tone of the future generations will turn darker as a result of being in that climate. However, that's not true. Genetics doesn't work that way. A white person like me may get more of a suntan if I'm in the sun more frequently and in an environment like that, but those characteristics will not be passed on to my future offspring or anybody else's. Your genetic background, your genotype, that which is found in your germline DNA, the eggs in the sperm, that genotype, what you receive from your parents, that's, what, that's the only thing that would get passed on to your offspring. And that doesn't change from the environment. Therefore, you can only pass along to your offspring one of the two versions of the genotypes that you received from your parents. Phenotypic characteristics acquired during your lifetime, such as bigger muscles from pumping iron, those will not get passed on to your offspring. Neither do genetic changes in our somatic DNA, which is the DNA that's found all in all the other cells of your body that are not your eggs and sperm. Only what's in your germline DNA gets passed on, that which is in the eggs and sperm, and your germline is what you get from your parents. However, if you were to acquire a mutation in your germline DNA, 
then that would be passed along to your offspring because it's in your germline DNA. So I wanted to clarify how heritability works because you need to understand this to follow some of the other points I'm going to make on this topic. So polymorphisms create different versions of the genes, which are called alleles, which create the genotype, which create varying proteins, which in turn then create different phenotypes. This happens because as we learn from molecular biology, changing the DNA bases will alter the RNA that's transcribed. If that change is within the coding region of a gene, and it changes a codon, it can then change the amino acid that's encoded in that position. This can thereby change the protein that's translated. So polymorphisms create different alleles or expressed, expressed versions of the same gene. Whether you have blonde hair, brown hair, or red hair, whether your hair is straight, wavy, or curly, whether you have brown eyes or blue eyes, whether you're short or tall, whether you have white skin, black skin, brown skin, or red skin, we all still have these features. We all have these features because we all have the genes that encode the proteins that create these features. However, we do not all have the same versions of these features because we have different alleles of these genes in our germline DNA. They're simply expressed differently depending on the alleles you possess of the genes that are involved in the creation of those physical features. The presence of polymorphisms, places where the DNA has some minor differences, is what creates these different alleles. Therefore, the polymorphisms create the different gene alleles, and the gene alleles create the genotype, and the genotype creates the phenotype, where the gene alleles are expressed as proteins. Now, for the sake of clarity, I'd also like to point out that the polymorphisms and the alleles that they generate do not stop at our external features. They're also the force behind all the variable parts of our phenotype, which includes the ones that are not physically visible, such as our blood type, our drug metabolism differences, our immune system, etc., etc., with the exception of the presence of mutations that do have genetic consequences and impact a person's phenotype. And incidentally, I spent seven years managing the genotyping laboratory of a major pharmaceutical company where we genotype patients of their clinical trials to determine the impact that the genotypes of their drug metabolism genes had on their response to the medications that they received in the trials. So I've spent a lot of time working with polymorphisms alleles, and genotypes, and the science behind them, as well as the science of determining and, and um, testing them, which is called genotyping. But here's the essential piece of information about polymorphisms. I've stated it once, and I'll state it here again. Polymorphisms create different expressed versions of the same gene. This is absolutely critical for you to understand about polymorphisms, so please don't miss it. Polymorphisms do not create new genes or new species. They do not introduce any new genetic information, and so they do not change our genes into other genes. Polymorphisms are naturally occurring genetic variation that simply gets shuffled around in varying rates and percentages depending on the population that you're examining. This is the reason, as, as I already explained, different people groups will have different phenotypes. 
their skin tones, their eye color, hair color, etc. Populations that have remained within the same geographical areas for an extended period of time are basically just passing along the same alleles repeatedly. Therefore, that's the primary phenotype that you observe in that given population. And I'd like to point out something else here too. Most people think that Darwin's theory of natural selection was something new, but it wasn't. Edward Blythe published his theory of natural selection 24 years earlier, which he called artificial selection, in three articles in the Magazine of Natural History between 1835 and 1837. Darwin even cited Blythe and his work in his book, The Origin of Species. However, a significant difference between the two was that Blythe was a Christian and a creationist. His theory stated how natural selection was responsible for restoring organisms to their archetype, not forming new species. This occurred by enriching gene pools through selection of the best genetic alleles, terms and concepts that would become understood later in time after the field of genetics was both originated and advanced. Furthermore, the theory of natural selection that Edward Blythe formed 24 years earlier than Darwin's theory was accurately founded on these genetic truths of polymorphisms and the alleles that they generate. Bly's theory of natural selection correctly addresses polymorphisms and alleles as the source of phenotypic variation and has nothing to do with evolution. Darwin's theory of evolution was nothing new either. This, the philosophical belief in evolution had been around for a long time prior to Darwin coming on the scene. However, what was new was how Darwin created his theory of natural selection to account for evolution, and supposedly supported it with his extensive collection of field observations. Never before had evolution been supposedly supported by science and stated with a model to supposedly explain how it happens. So Darwin wasn't as groundbreaking as everyone seems to think he was. And I'll give you that extra information for free today. You're welcome. So please get this critical take home message from today. Polymorphisms are not random mutations. Therefore, Polymorphisms have nothing to do with evolution. They are not a source of genetic variation for evolution. They never have been and they never will be. So please grasp this and don't forget it. This is critical to understanding the rhetoric with which the evolutionists try to dazzle you. Ah, uh, dazzle. We used to have a children's book called Dazzle the Dinosaur that my, that my boys loved to read when they were little. Anybody else ever read that one? My boys love that one, Dazzle the Dinosaur. And I'll give you that for free today too. Man, I'm just giving all kinds of stuff away today for free. But I'm going to stop here now. And there's still a lot more that I want to explain to you about polymorphisms. So come on back for the next video. And if you like what you hear, give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, we'll leave the light on for you.